We now have uh, Teresa Eder um, on the topic anti-Semitic yet pro-Israel, how the Austrian Freedom Party tries to square a circle. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very grateful for being here today. Um, and Mark already touched a little bit upon the Freedom Party. Um, I will talk about the Freedom Party's attempt um, to normalize relations with Israel. Um, and uh, I'll start with an example. Uh, last month, uh, Christian Hafenecke, the Secretary General of the far-right Freedom Party, sent a letter to the Israeli ambassador to Austria. Um, and in his letter, the ambassador, um, uh, the Secretary General, defended the Freedom Party against accusations of anti-Semitism. Um, he argued that members of the Freedom Party were unfairly accused of showing Nazi salutes and that the media was giving these alleged incidents too much attention and painting a picture of the party's ideological leanings that wasn't accurate. Um, Hafnecke then emphasized that the Freedom Party condemned any form of extremist philosophies and that it is the only party that expels members immediately who propagate these um, philosophies. Um, so why would the Secretary General write a letter to the Israeli ambassador? Um, for starters, Israel boycotts the Freedom Party and in fact there is no direct line of communication between um, the Freedom Party's ministers and the Israeli government at this point. Um, that also includes Austria's foreign minister, Karin Kneisel, who is not a member of the Freedom Party, but was nominated by the Freedom Party. Um, so this letter is one instance of a larger trend. Um, the Freedom Party <coughs> seeks normalization with the state of Israel, and as I will argue, without actually transforming or getting rid of its anti-Semitic practices. Um, how should one interpret this move? Um, I want to get to the bottom of this puzzle and I'm going to explore the motives, strategies and success <coughs> of the Freedom Party. Um, I seek to answer three questions in my talk today. Um, first, why does a historically anti-Semitic party seek normalization with Israel to begin with? Um, second, what are the strategies that it uses to achieve these goals? And thirdly, will it succeed? So, um, just going to give you the status quo and what I think, um, how likely it will be that something like that will happen in the near future. Um, in the beginning, I just want to give a short background. Um, most of you probably know some of this or all of this, but I just wanted to um, reiterate some points. Um, the Freedom Party is the successor party of the VDU, Verein der Unabhängigen, which served as a home for former Nazis after the Second World War. And until the 80s, the party actually achieved little success. Uh, that changed under Chairman Jörg Haider, who led the party into government in 1999, when 27% of Austrians voted for the Freedom Party. Uh, when the party entered government in 2000, uh, it caused political tremors throughout Europe. Um, and for the first and only time, the European Union chose to impose sanctions on one of its own member states, and broke off diplomatic relations, largely because it judged that the Austrian government included a right-wing extremist anti-Semitic party. Uh, in 2005, Heinz Christian Strache took over as a chairman of the, uh, of the party, and he still is the chairman, and he shifted the party platform even further to the right. Um, so for example, since 2011, the Freedom Party is again, um, after a short break in the 90s, advocating for a Volksgemeinschaft, so an ethnic culturally defined people, um, and this is also part of their party program, so you can read this in, in their own party program. Um, relevant to my talk today, um, the party openly reversed its approach, approach <coughs> towards Israel in 2010, when Heinz Christian Strache went to Israel for the first time with other European far-right leaders. Um, he and other European politicians signed the Jerusalem Declaration, which emphasized um, Israel's right to defend itself, especially against Islamic terror. Fast forward to uh, 2017, when the Freedom Party entered government again. 
This time, the European Union didn't sanction the Freedom Party, in large part because many governments have to contend with a strong right-wing populist presence these days. In Austria's case, um, the far right is as strong as ever. Almost 40% of the Freedom Party parliamentarians are members of extremist nationalistic fraternities, so-called Burschenschaften, and that is actually double the amount than in 2000. Um, and most of the members of its federal board are also active in the scene. One of them, Herbert Kickl, is now interior minister, and he oversees law enforcement agencies and the intelligence agency that tracks right-wing extremists. So, um, just real quick again, in 1999 we had EU sanctions, uh, then there was a further shift to the right in 2010. The Freedom Party switched uh, its approach towards Israel and in 2017. Since 2017 they are in government again, but no real sanctions. Um, Uh, the Freedom Party's reaction these days um, to any sort of display of anti-Semitism um, follows a pattern. So the leadership always uh, speaks of single incidents, they call it Einzelfall, um, something that is not fostered and fueled by the party. But the data actually paints a very different picture. In the first uh, year of government there were about 50 right-wing extremist incidents that occurred um, and were tied to the party. Uh, one of the most notable incidents uh, in 2018 revolved around a Nazi songbook being used at the fraternity Germania, which called for the murder of Jews and celebrated the Holocaust. Um, and Udo Landbauer, the leading party candidate in Lower Austria, was implicated in that scandal. Um, he stepped down for a few months but he's active again as the head of the party in Lower Austria. Uh, then just a couple other examples. There was also a, a call for a kosher um, meat register in Lower Austria as well. And um, every other week you hear reports about Freedom Party members being part of Facebook groups uh, where um, anti-Semitic images are shared. So this happens on a very regular basis. Um, one other example, because I, I find it almost ironic, a Freedom Party official was also the attaché to the Austrian embassy in Israel, and he posted a pictures from Tel Aviv in a Nazi t-shirt. Um, the Austrian Mauthausen Committee assesses, assesses that since the participation of the Freedom Party in the government, these incidents have actually increased. Um, and social media platforms I, I feel like we, we've already seen this in the uh, prior talks, um, have become an important outlet that allows people to pick up on different nods and winks. And it is not the public rhetoric that uh, the party leadership puts forward these days. So I'm now moving on to my questions. Um, first, why is the Freedom Party uh, so eager to reach out to Israel at this point? Um, nowadays, no one in the Freedom Party wants to be called an anti-Semite and uh, that's part of the reason why they are so eager to start fresh with Israel. It's the only stain left on its, public, uh, on its political record and if Israel were to end the boycott, this would be a huge public relations win for the Freedom Party because they could justifiably say, look, the Israeli government sees us as a legitimate power, legitimate partner, so how can we be anti-Semites? And this would especially solidify support amongst those voters who are not traditionally anti-Semitic but vote for the Freedom Party because of their anti-migration and anti-Muslim policies. Uh, also on an international level, the party of course would gain legitimacy and um, uh, Foreign Minister, in, Foreign Minister Karin Kneissel, who you can see on the left, She's trying to get into direct contact um, with different people in Israel. Um, she has tried several times to establish talks with the Israelis. Um, he's also tweeting about that. Um, she met the Minister of Housing. Um, and then she also apparently talked to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in Warsaw just recently. Um, and uh, it's funny because she um, 
made it very clear that she had talks with Prime Minister Netanyahu, whereas his staff characterized the whole encounter more as a surprise, um, making it seem as if the foreign minister was desperately trying to reach out and connect. Um, so moving on uh, to my second question, how does the Freedom Party pursue this normalization and what uh, strategies does it use? And I want to be clear here, I'm, I'm approaching this question from the Freedom Party's perspective, so it doesn't mean that the, the strategies are actually reciprocated by the Israeli government. Um, first, the Freedom Party thinks it can exploit, oh sorry, can exploit compatible ideologies. Um, members of the Freedom Party believe that they share with the Israeli government a right-wing ideological agenda and ethnocentric view. So when Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu says that Israel is not a state of all its citizens um, and is excluding Israeli Arab citizens, um, like he did two weeks ago, that, for example, sort of solidifies this notion for the Freedom Party. Um, but overall, um, I think it's important to understand that the Freedom Party lacks the categories and the context to understand the diversity of Israeli society and politics. Um, it looks as, at Israel first as a monolithic bloc and consequently um, Jews in Israel are actually seen as non-Jewish Jews, exceptional Jews, um, and um, also in addition to that Jews are constrained to a certain place, they're only in Israel, so this actually doesn't interfere with their usual anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about world Jewry or the attacks on the East Coast bankers and Wall Street and so forth. And I have to say, I don't have any studies that I can show you, but I cannot remember that the party leader Strache actually refers to Jews when he talks about Israel, he only talks about Israelis. Um, and it is also notable that since the shift in 2010, you see less and less anti-Zionist rhetoric among the Freedom Party. Um, secondly, um, the Freedom Party thinks that it can foster a common enemy. Um, it, can, it tries to deflect attention away from its own anti-Semitism towards Muslim anti-Semitism. And so it's, for example, no coincidence that the first event put on by the Freedom Party's newly founded think tank in February of this year was titled Muslim Antisemitism. Um, so while Muslim antisemitism is of course a prevalent form of antisemitism uh, that definitely needs to be addressed, it is a convenient excuse for far-right uh, extremist parties to deflect from their own history and present problems. And they can use this fight against Muslim antisemitism to claim to be an ally of Israel in the Middle East conflict. Um, especially Israeli right is susceptible to the Freedom Party's focus on Muslim anti-Semitism, but uh, the party also hasn't made many inroads in the past. There are one or two uh, Israeli politicians that they're in regular contact with and are inviting um, to Austria and vice versa. And thirdly, um, what else works in the Freedom Party's favor? Um, I would argue that they can use the political cover of an ostensibly mainstream center-right party. Uh, Chancellor Kurz um, is very visibly engaged against anti-Semitism, which in my view helps the Freedom Party. Um, he has tweeted more than 30 times about the fight against anti-Semitism in, in his first 16 months being Chancellor and I cannot remember any other <coughs> state ever, ever tweeting about anti-Semitism. Um, he also hosted an anti-Semitism conference at the end of 2018 as part of the EU presidency, yet um, whenever um, he, the media sheds light on his uh, coalition partner's anti-Semitic statements and behavior, he remains silent. Um, so, moving on. Uh, will the Freedom Party succeed with its efforts? Uh, I would think not in the near future, mainly because of three different reasons. Um, 
there hasn't been a sincere examination of the past. One indicator for that would also be that the Austrian Jewish community is boycotting the Freedom Party and its board has voted unanimously to continue this boycott. Um, the commemoration of Nazis is ongoing. It's, it's more like uh, the Freedom Party tries to um, distance itself from anti-Semitism, but not from anti-Semites. Um, one example for that is also that, um, that they're not very sincere in their efforts. Um, that uh, this, the, this cartoon that you see on the um, top, um, Strache only deleted this cartoon in 2018, right before Cance uh, Chancellor Kurz uh, was going to Israel, and it was online for six years. Um, and uh, you probably can't, well, it's, it was widely debated, but he kept it on his Facebook account for six whole years. Um, we are also still waiting for the result of a historical commission that was set up right after the Nazi book scandal that I mentioned earlier. But um, this historical commission doesn't consist really of independent experts, but people with ties to the Freedom Party, so we can't really expect a lot of this either. Um, then, if you look at policies, there hasn't been a real sincere shift. Um, Austria, um, Austria's voting record at the UN uh, remains the same. Um, so, for example, the uh, Freedom Party uh, was applauding the decision of the US to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, but uh, when it came to voting uh, for it, uh, in the UN General Assembly, it decided not to do that. Um, the same also is true for Austria's policy toward Iran. There hasn't been a real change with the Freedom Party being in power. Um, and then lastly, uh, the political situation in Israel also doesn't really um, lend itself to, to normalize relations right now. Um, Netanyahu doesn't seem to have an incentive right now to really go through with this, and he also, of course, um, and I think this is important to emphasize, the Freedom Party is perceived differently because of the Holocaust. Um, it's perceived differently than the Fidesz Party, for example, in Hungary. Um, so, in closing, I want to say that um, I still I think there is a lot at stake in the future. Um, I see the Freedom Party as a crucial case here because it is kind of an anomaly compared to Fidesz, or even the AFD, um, or um, the Front National and other far-right parties in, Aust um, in Europe, for two reasons, because, first of all, um, there has been opposition against it from the start um, by Israel, and it is currently in a government position, contrary to most other parties. Um, so, were the Freedom Party to actually succeed in its endeavors, I think this would have larger consequences for how we look um, at anti-Semitism and pro-Israel alliances these days, and I'm curious to hear from you what you think about that. Thank you.